Welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Discover what's possible when people impacted by autism inspire change and build community. Together with the Global Autism Project, here's your host, Rachel Harmon. Hello, everyone. Our guest today is Maggie Nunez. Originally from Dominican Republic and currently living in New Jersey, Maggie is a mother of three, two of whom are autistic. Her sons, Daryl and Alvin, are 16 and 13 years old. As a cancer survivor, Maggie hopes to encourage other parents to prioritize their own health in order to effectively take care of their children. In today's conversation, we discuss her two sons' autistic strengths, challenges her son Daryl has overcome, thinking about her children's future, what motherhood has taught her about herself, autism acceptance in Dominican culture, her family's supportive attitude, and advice for other parents. In this episode, discover what's possible when taking care of yourself lets you take care of others. For more information about Maggie, please visit our show notes at autismknowsnoborders.com. We appreciate your time. If you enjoy this podcast and you'd like to support our mission, please take just a few seconds to share it with one person who you think will find value in it too. You can also follow us on Instagram at Autism Podcast, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Global Autism Project, and join our community on Mighty Networks at community.globalautismproject.org. And now, I present you, Maggie Nunez. Hi, Maggie. Welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Thank you for being here today. Hi, Rachel. It's my pleasure. Could you please briefly introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Maggie Nunez. Uh, I'm from Fairlawn, New Jersey. I'm the mother of three children, two of whom are autistic, Samantha, Darielle, and Alvin. Okay. How old are your kids? Samantha is 20, Darielle is 16, and Alvin is 13. Okay. So tell us about your children, especially the ones with autism. What are some of their interests? First, could you clarify which ones are on the spectrum? On the spectrum is uh, Darielle and Alvin. They love electronics. They love restaurants, (laughs) family time. Mm. What's their relationship like? You mean Darielle and Alvin or the three of them? The three of them, yeah. They get along pretty well. Sammy and uh, Darielle would interact the most since Darielle is is verbal and Darielle is is more um, high functioning. Usually she would take him out to buy lunch, do spend time together. She's always working, so when whenever she has a day off and uh, she feels that they haven't been engaging much, she'll take him out to eat. And uh, Darielle and Alvin, Darielle is very caring. He cares for his brother, but they don't really have that big bond. They care for each other, but they since they have different interests and their ages different too you know if we go to the park if I ask Darielle go play with Alvin Darielle will go watch Alvin but Alvin doesn't really engage Mm -hmm. you know in the playing Alvin just wants to do whatever he wants to do so it's hard to really like get Alvin attention and be like Alvin let's play ball you know you might throw the ball at you know for him to catch but he might run around because something else got his attention. So it's it's the relationship that they have is more like caring and watching over but and trying to engage, but sometimes they will click, <laughs> you know, they will be playing. And then other time, Alvin would just be totally distracted. Hmm. How does Alvin communicate? He was nonverbal. But then he started, his, his speech is very limited. 
if he wants to go to a restaurant, he would say, I want restaurant, please. Or he'll say, I want park. And if I ask him, use your words nicely, he'll say, I want to go park. But if if, if I don't tell him to use his words nice, you know, cover the, the proper way, he'll just be, I want food or I want park or I want pool. Okay. So what are some of their strengths related to autism? They're willing. They're always willing. Sometimes you spend too much time in your own head. And if you stop your thoughts and you would listen and you know that somebody's trying to help you, you would go along. And uh, they're willing to listen, to get instruction, to follow through. But sometimes it's, it's, it's you against the distraction, whatever distraction they have. But once you get their attention and their focus, you're able to work with them. I would also say that they're very, very loving and kind. And uh, what else? They're very savvy when it comes to technology. <laughs> <laughs> like helping you get on this Zoom call? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So how does autism affect their lives? Ooh. It's hard to answer that question, Rachel, because it will be under my opinion, my perspective. And they might have a different, <laughs> different answer than because it's how it affects them directly. Mm -hmm. So um, if you ask me, Alvin, Alvin is the happiest boy. If you give him food... <laughs> and electronics, he is all in, you know, he is very motivated by food and he's a happy boy. So he wakes up every morning excited, ready to go, like full of energy. You don't see nothing, you know, like him being feeling limited because he's autistic. He's just ready. And, uh, when it comes to Darielle, I would say it has affected him the most because he is aware of the diagnosis and uh, he has been through so much on his journey from knowing that he was autistic, from not being able to control a lot of his uh, emotions and everything that was happening, the school system as well, you know, so... To be honest, I'm like, I'm Darielle's biggest fan. Mm -hmm. He has been through so much and, and everything that he has overcome. I have so much respect and admiration for him. So I can say. Yeah. What were some of those challenges that he overcame? Uh, Darielle was uh, placed in an out-of-district school. Because uh, when he was in the regular school system in district, they couldn't meet his needs. So they had to send him to an out-of-district school. Being in that environment and uh, not feeling comfortable and not feeling happy where he was. But yet, you know, I'm thinking he's in the right placement because of how he's acting. So it took a long time and a lot of uh, moving from different town, different school system for me to really talk to him, you know, for different services, for him to actually be able to show me that he was ready for me to trust that he could uh, function in industry school. So that, that was one of the challenges that he faced and he overcame. And uh, also he was uh, depressed. He uh, suffered from bullying in the one of the school that he was. And uh, going through different um, psychiatrists, different appointments, I was actually told that he needed to be um, hospitalized because he was making threats. They felt that it was safe for him to be in the hospital for a few days. 
What was that like for you to take him to the hospital? It was the hardest thing, to be honest, because at that time, I, uh, I had an illness. Uh, I had uh, cancer in my stomach. I was diagnosed with gastric cancer, uh, but it was only the cancer cells that I had. So um, I had to be in the hospital for 35 days away from home and away from the children. And at that time, Dariel was very confused, very anxious with the school, not being happy in the school. But yet, I still didn't know if taking him out of that school was the right thing to do. Because I'm, I'm like, what do I do? I would talk to him and I told him that it's, it's not up to me. It's up to how he would behave. Because if he didn't change his ways and the way he was behaving, he wasn't going to be able. Uh, you have to help yourself in a way. If he didn't feel that that was the right place for him, and if he knew that that school was for kids with behavior challenges, then he would have to control his, his, his behavior and his emotions. And But then Daria would uh, control his emotions. Um, in the school, and uh, when he would get home, he would explode. Mm. So it was difficult for me because every time that I would go to the school, he's great. They would say he's, he's amazing, but in the house, it was a different child. Were you getting any support at home? At home, I did. He had therapy. Darvial um, had services for his uh, behavior. He never liked therapists. He felt that um, they'll take too much of his time. He had a, a thing, he felt like if, if they'll come for an hour, that hour he missed from doing whatever he wanted to do. Mm. So that was always difficult. But then he would, you know, most of the therapy session, it, it was hard to really connect with him because his mind was so upset because they took his time. What kind of therapy was it? It was a uh, behavior therapy. And kind of like counseling at the same time. Mm. So after you took him to the hospital, was he better? Absolutely. That did it <laughs> for him. To me, I felt terrible leaving him there, but it was to a point where I would take him to the psychiatrist and they'll tell me that I should take him to the hospital if he continues to make threats. But I kind of thought to myself, he's only saying it just to say it. I know my child, he's not going to do that. But at the same time, I wouldn't know how much stress he had or, or how overwhelmed he was. And he only take a minute for someone to do something, you know. And he was making threats about his, li his life. Mm. And um, it was difficult, Rachel. It was very difficult. Leaving him there, it was uh, hard. He actually um, changed his perspective. It was like something that he needed because coming out of the hospital, he had to follow up with uh, another service that uh, I had to drop him off for like two times a week, another program where it's like a group well, with, with the different kids. Like first they will be in the hospital and then they'll send him to follow up. And uh, I guess he was able to look back and he knew that that was not a good place to be. Mm. He missed his family. His, he missed home. He was there for five days. So that separation, he has never slept out of the house. So that was a, a big thing. After being in that program for a few months, I've never had to call on services for that real. He went back to school like a different person. Hmm. 
since I saw progress in his behavior, I uh, spoke with the school system, with the child study team, and uh, I was able to really advocate so that he could be transferred into the in-school district, which I have no regrets because coming in in district, Tarviel has done amazing. He has been in an uh, an honor, honor student, and from when he was small, going into into that school, needing somebody to be behind him from point A to B. From me to see my son walk into school on his own, now it's it's. I have no words. <laughs> <laughs> I have no words. Well, that's amazing that he was able to overcome that and choose something else. You know, sometimes with autistic people, it's so hard because they feel misunderstood from people around them. And it's like putting so much pressure on them to change when really if, you know, the teachers around him or the community were able to support him in a way to accept him and help him know that it's not him, like there's nothing wrong with him. Exactly. Yeah. I feel like they just need to be, we need to listen to them sometimes, but it, sometimes it's hard because it's their behavior and their actions. And in order for you to trust them, it's a difficult decision to make. But with him, I, I saw everything he was going through. I saw pain in his eyes. He was not in a good place. Sometimes it's hard. You don't know when you're helping, when you're helping by stopping services or when you need to call back on services. Yeah. As a mother, those are really hard decisions to make. Absolutely. So when this happened to Dario, how old was he? Like early teens? This happened to Dario, I would say, uh, three years ago. Okay. Almost three years ago, that's like two and a half. Right. And so adolescence is just challenging for almost everyone. For everyone. Yeah. And as you were saying, you know, some kids deal with depression, anxiety, trying to fit in at school or in different environments. And we actually have a question from one of our community members related to this topic. Her name is Mary Johnston, and she wants to know. What's the best anxiety resource for your sons? The best anxiety resource? I don't know. I, I would say it's us, the parents. It <laughs> 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 yes, works for me, you know, because if, if I would bring somebody in the house to try to calm him down, Dario down, because uh, with Alvin, he doesn't really show much anxiety. In order for you to de-escalate from your anxiety, you have to feel comfortable. And if you're not willing to talk to somebody else or listen, it has to be with someone close to you or that you will connect. To de-escalate his anxiety, I would say I'll tell him to go to the bathroom, to wash his face, to take deep, deep breath in and out, or go outside for a walk. If, I, if he wants me to go with him for a walk, we could go for a walk. And uh, it has help. Or to let whatever is inside of him, to let it out. And I would always tell him, after you speak about it, you're going to feel much better. And he has helped. Hmm. What do you think about when you consider their future? To be honest, like I try to take it one day at a time. I don't like to really like stress myself much with thoughts, but um, I see a bright future, especially for both of them. But Dariel has turned his life around in such a way that I see him living a normal life, independent. He uh, actually has his permit. I'm going to see if I can get him to take uh, classes to maybe get his license. Mm -hmm. So um, I see a, a bright future for both of them. 
Does Dariel have friends now? He has some, that's one of the main things with him. Is socially, he isn't much, he won't really like start conversation, but if you engage him, he would answer whatever you're saying or he would engage. So uh, he has some some friends, but it's it's online. <laughs> Before the pandemic, when he used to go to that um, out of district school, he has some kids in there that he'll get along, and I would drop him off so for some play day sometimes. But um, after the pandemic, that everybody's home, he hasn't been really socializing much. Yeah, it's been hard for everyone. Absolutely. Does Alvin receive any services now? At this moment, he's not. Okay. Are you preparing him for also living independently? We are. <laughs> In the school that he goes to, they're, they're amazing. They're life skill teacher. The, his main teacher, she's great. So they are teaching him how to do his laundry, how to use the dishwasher, how to use the microwave, and. Uh, we work close together. So um, if he's doing something in the school, I try to practice it here at home with him. And he's learning how to do his laundry. He, he does chores for me, like, uh, Alvin, uh, let's sweep the floor. Mm -hmm. He tried. Life skills, to me, is for him to do things on his own is, is very important. But as far as if he's really able to live on his own, uh, I don't know, because <laughs> he has a lot more limitations than Dariel does. Alvin needs eyes on him all the time. He's not aware of, of danger. He's, what can I say? There was a time that uh, he was able to open the door and he ran out of the house. He had done this a few times. And when he was smaller, now he sees the door open, he closes the door. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But still, you know, it's it's to a point where I cannot say, oh, I feel safe if my eyes are not on him. He needs eyes on him all the time. Okay. What have you learned about yourself from being a mother? Uh, <laughs> what have I learned? I'm learning something every day. Uh, what have I learned? Rachel, I was not raised by my mother. I was raised by my grandmother in Dominican Republic. My grandmother had 10 kids of her own and four of her kids had special needs. And uh, I never had that one mother to daughter attention. And um, <laughs> being to be a mom, I first needed to learn how to mother my own self. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not saying that my grandmother didn't do a fantastic job. She did whatever she could. And I'm so grateful for her to this day. But um, being a mother and uh, having two diagnoses back to back and learning about autism and finding resources and doing the very best that I can every day, I've learned that I'm stronger than, I'm much more stronger than what I thought I was. I'm able to face challenges and overcome them. So, and I'm still able to, to try my very best to be uh, positive and uh, self-motivated because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you can read a hundred positive quotes <laughs> <laughs> if you can read them. But if you don't make an effort in your every day to do the best, to wake up and do what you have to do, regardless of how you might be feeling. Yeah. So did you grow up in Dominican Republic? I came to this country when I was 14. Okay. Did you know about autism before having your first son? No idea what it was. Okay. So actually we have a partner in Dominican Republic, one of our global autism partners. She's in Santo Domingo. She has an autism center there. Oh, wow. But from your experience, being, I guess, Dominican-American, having both cultures mixed, what do you think is the 
level of acceptance and understanding of autism within the Dominican culture, especially in the U.S.? Mm. I would say that to a lot of parents, acceptance and acknowledging that their kids have special needs sometimes take longer because they want it, they think that the kid is fine. You know, they might be showing some red flags here and there, but they still think that, no, they don't need no, no therapy. They're fine. They're fine. And I feel that the earliest that you can see that, that your kid ha- needs some, some therapy or evalu- to be evaluated is, is so beneficial for them. So I feel that I'm on, uh, you know, like my culture, Dominicans, or I don't know. It could happen in other cultures too. Mm-hmm. But um, accepting that uh, there's something wrong, that they might need help, is difficult. How did you finally come to accept your son's autism? I uh, embraced it. I accept it because that's the best thing you can do. With Ariel, when I was told he was uh, autistic, I just listened to the evaluation and I, I was able to, because sometimes they might be showing some, some red flags, but we don't even see them. But once you take them to the doctor and the doctor would point certain things, and you look at them and you were like, you'd be like, oh my God, it's true. I wasn't paying attention to that. I accept it because that's my son. I love him. And uh, I am here to do whatever is necessary for him to be happy, to be okay. And how about with Alvin? Did you get an evaluation early on? Did you see some signs right away? Daria was more delayed into walking. Daria was uh, more delayed in saying his first words. So with Alvin, everything was different. I was paying more attention because I had already known about Daria. So he was very alert. Everything was going great with him. And then when he, when he turned two years old, he froze. He stopped making eye contact. He just was in his own bubble, his own world. And how did their father respond? Was he also accepting right away? Yes, we were. We actually went for genetic testing since both of them uh, were uh, diagnosed back to back. Uh, They suggested us to do the testing and it came back negative. But we've both worked really close in uh, helping them doing it's just, it's not about us it's it's about them it's what we can do to make everything better for them we have been moving from different town they've trying to find a, a good school system for Darielle and Alvin and uh, we live for this for these boys <laughs> yeah. That's one thing that I, I tried for my family to, for us to be genuine, for us to keep it real. If you're upset about something, let's talk about it. You know, let's see how we can work it out. Because to be honest, Rachel, when you have a, a diagnosis in one family, the whole family is affected. The whole family is affected in so many different ways. And if we don't communicate and let things out, we're not going to make it. We're not going to make it work. I've been with my husband for 20 years and having a, a kids with special needs, a lot of, I, I believe 75% or maybe 80% of the, of the couples, they end up getting divorced or separating. I'm not going to tell you that it has been, everything has been great. <laughs> We've had our, our ups and downs in all areas, but we fix things instead of breaking or everybody going their way. Let's 
see how we can do better. Let's pick each other up when one is down. Let's keep it real. How do you take care of yourself? Oh, Lord. <laughs> how do I take care of myself? Well, I try my best. I uh, take care of myself by keeping my mental <laughs> space, my circle of people that I surround myself with. I try to be careful about, because I'm very sensitive, I can absorb more than what I need. <laughs> so I try to be surrounded by great people, positive people. I love to go to the gym. That's like my outlet. I feel like we all need something that we love to do and to make sure that we don't compromise that time. Like to me, going to the gym is my therapy. And reading books, listening to podcasts, that's another way of me taking care of myself. Not doing the dishes if I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes we think that by taking care of yourself is by going to the salon and doing your nails. That's taking care of yourself as well. I do that sometimes, don't get me wrong. But it could also be saying no to an invitation that you get because you know that you're going to feel better by not going to that place. It could be by not being friends with somebody that is draining you because you know that if, if, if somebody's going to be draining you, you're not going to be mentally okay because you're giving too much of your energy to somebody that is not even... <sighs> you give your energy to someone who maybe is taking too much energy out of you. Exactly. Yeah. It's important too to have some friends, you know, like us as, as autism moms, we need like a support system to have friends where you disconnect from the kids from home where you can vent. <laughs> where <laughs> going out with my friends is another thing that I don't, negotiate you know we go out at least once a month we go for coffee we go for lunch for dinner it's so important I don't have a a lot of friends but I do have a few that have been so helpful you know to have there to to disconnect to talk to catch up because sometimes, you know, when for me that I don't work and I'm dedicated 100% to my family and my kids, I feel like we play, we can play different roles. So when I'm with my friends, I would dress up. I would, <laughs> I'm not mommy today. Let's not talk. <laughs> Even though I love them, but let them be home. So I feel like taking that time too, so that we can remember how we look all dolled up and cute. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you're home all the time, you even forget, not, not forget, but you neglect this area of your life that is also important. Mm. You know, you want to get pretty, you, you want your significant other to be like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you all put together. So, <laughs> yeah, and it's so good to have a support system. Yes, I couldn't have done it. I couldn't have made it, you know, like going through all this, uh, going through everything that I went through, having my friends, my close friends being there supportive has been a blessing. I'm very grateful and thankful for each of them, and they know who they are. Mm. <laughs> so, were you always taking care of yourself before? Uh, I have always, I thought at some point that, uh, like I said, going to the gym was taking care of myself. Going to the gym, it is taking care of yourself, but it depends. Like when you have kids with special needs, you have a lot going on. You're always on the go. I had therapists coming in and out. There were times that I'll be in the supermarket and the therapist will be like, I'm ringing the doorbell. I'm here. 
And I'm like, oh my God, I forgot that you were coming today. Because having therapies for both boys in the house, there were times that I'll go to appointments and they'll ask, what is Darielle's date of birth? I will give Darielle's birthday and Alvin's year. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. What was your experience like with the therapists? Great. I always had a good therapist coming in and and the main thing is is working together. You know, because if the therapists come home and the parents are not on the same page with the therapist, you're not going to get the best results. Mm -hmm. Once the therapist is out, the child would easily forget the purpose, you know, the reason why the therapist was here. Yeah. And parents know their kids best. You guys are the experts. Absolutely. Yeah. We are. <laughs> so what's been a big priority for you when parenting? Nutrition and autism is beyond important. That you know, no, the difference that it could make when you make changes in the diets of the children. Yeah. I'm saying it because my kids, both of them, they were so picky with their food. You know, Daria would come to the kitchen holding his nose because he didn't like the smell of whatever I was cooking. He would only eat junk food and snack after snack and Alvin the same way. And uh, I'm like a police in my house when it comes from <laughs> at least Monday to Thursday. I tell them we have to eat the same thing that I cook, everybody eats. So slowly I've been cutting the junks in their food and I'm introducing the whole food because I, I truly believe that food is much more than food. Food is love, food is information, food is medicine. And uh, when we see it like that, because I love, I also love to cook. I love to cook for other people, like to have people coming over. Oh. That is one of the things that I enjoy most, to be in service, to show love through food, to talk about food and how beneficial it is for us to be mindful when we're in the supermarket. You know, are you spending too much inside the aisles in the supermarket? That's where the no good food is. <laughs> <laughs> when you go food shopping, go around the clock, like around the clock, that's where you have the produce, the fruits, the good stuff. I've always uh, tried to make healthy choices when it comes to my food, but ever since I lost my stomach too, and that I'm more in tune in, with my body and my health and my well-being, I'm like watching over the kids. What are you doing? What are you eating? No, we're not going to eat this today. We're going to stick to eating real food. And Darielle and Alvin, like, is the change that I've seen on their behavior, on their skin. You know, they also say that what you eat in, 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 pri in private shows in public. <laughs> 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 so um, to be honest, Rachel, to see them, you know, to see them eating real food, it's like I'm winning. I'm winning. It's like sometimes it's like the smallest thing, like for us parents, a smallest thing could cause so much joy and we celebrate it. Like, oh my God, Alvin is eating carrots. Are you serious? Like I'll tell my husband, can you believe that he ate carrots? <laughs> Oh, oh, we have to keep on buying carrots, you know, and it would make like such a big deal about it. We're like, Alvin, and I would tell my daughter, and I'm like, Alvin, Alvin ate carrots. Oh, then we start celebrating it for him, and he likes it. And, and you know, by him seeing that we're pra praising him so much, that would make him eat more carrots. Yeah. And uh, that has been a thing, you know, in, with the pandemic. Uh, Having them home more time and being able to work with them more closely, I've been able to introduce more healthy food into their diet. And I've also been able to um, 
have them exercise. Dariel would used to spend so much time inside his room. Now Dariel is exercising because I have a mini gym in my garage. So to me, to think back and see Dariel, how he was and how right now he's letting me train him. He's eating my vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like at some point in my life, Rachel, I'm not going to lie to you. I, I felt like, how about me? You know, I'm, I'm just because I'm, I'm not working. I'm totally dedicated to my children. That's when before I would say, oh, I would like to get a job or I would get dressed up and be ready to go every day, put on my makeup, go out there in my heels. And uh, I would feel bad sometimes thinking about the fact that that was not what I was doing, that maybe that I wanted to experience that. But as I continue to do my everyday thing with my children, I enjoy it. I love waking up every day to make them breakfast. I love baking for them, you know, because if, if my son loves cookies and muffins and I read the label and I see everything that is on those cookies and muffins, and I know that if you buy an Oreo and if you put it in a in a mason jar and you leave it there for two years, it's going to look the same. So imagine <laughs> that's your body mm. by eating the Oreo. But if you cook, if you bake the cookie with the good ingredients, you know what your kid is eating. And I'm not saying by no means that I'm not going to let them eat a chocolate chip cookie or an Oreo if they want to do it on a random day. But I'm mindful. I'm mindful about what goes in their system, you know? If I can get in my phone and get a recipe for something that I know that is going to be good for them, I'm going to do it with so much love and joy <laughs> to see that they like it. And I'm like, you know, Alvin doesn't eat the yolk of the egg. He would eat the egg whites. But if I can add that yolk to a muffin mix, I'm like, he has no idea. He's, he's eating almond butter or he's eating yolk from an egg and it, these things are good for him so I feel like there's always a way and if you want to help your kid you know like sometimes even with autism we see the kids acting certain way they're so hyper they can focus and right away a lot of parents you know they take them to the doctor the doctor gave them a, a prescription mm. they start taking the medication so it's like the medication and the diet together will create behaviors. And then we might think, oh, it's due to the autism, but it might be due to the lifestyle. So if we do changes in the nutrition, we might see changes in behavior. Yeah. I mean, we normally don't talk about nutrition on this podcast because. I just want to stay away from kind of pseudosciences and misinformation, but I do agree with what you're saying about processed food yes. and sugar yes. as a general rule needing to be cut out. And I've seen a difference also in my own body when I've started to eliminate some of those things. And my husband is the chef in our house. So <laughs> I'm lucky that he cares about eating well too. And so he's always making sure that we're eating whole food and, that's, and that's things so like important, that. That's so important, Rachel. That is so important. And to be honest with you, if you ask me what, what are two things that I enjoy the most, it's going to the supermarket <laughs> and, uh, you know, buying my whole food and Preparing food for my family. Mm. And if you can add a third thing, that'll be the gym. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Maggie, I'd like to close with one last question. What advice would you give to other parents? My advice to other parents would be to listen to your child, listen to them, and be patient. Have 
acceptance. Because if you accept it, you embrace it. If you embrace it, every day you would find a way to make things happen with less friction, with less stress. And uh, take care of yourself and uh, listen to your body. I know we didn't talk much about my my illness, but uh, like I mentioned to you, I was diagnosed with uh, gastric cancers. I lost my stomach to the cancer and uh, I don't really know what caused the cancer to begin with, but I do believe that our body, sometimes we are so busy doing things and trying to be, to do more than what we can. And uh, our body takes notes of everything. Everything that we, you know, we might be young, we feel that, we can do this, we can do that, but you know, our body works in our favor for a period of time. But if you abuse it or if you um, neglect it, because there's so many areas that we need to, when it comes to, to our health, our well being, is uh, what are we eating? Are we sleeping? Are we uh, in movement? Because I feel like by having the lifestyle that I, I have, that I love to exercise, he had helped me so much bounce back from this illness, like the way that I did, and uh, continue to live and be able to care for my kids, even though I'm still struggling keeping up with my, my health. But I, I know that my body is my card. <laughs> So if I see a red light, I right away, I stop. I don't ignore it. I'm like, what's going on here? Because I know that my kids, our kids, they depend so much on us. And in order for us to be there and do the best that we can for them, first, we have to take care of ourselves the best that we can. And sometimes we just have to take that, that moment a few steps back and be able to look at ourselves from another perspective, you know? It's like, you're so busy doing so much, but relax yourself, look at what you're doing. Is it time to slow down? Is it time to not do the dishes? Is it time for just drink your coffee? (laughs) (laughs) Drink your coffee, drink your tea, take deep breath, read a book, meditate, say no to, to, to some invitations if, if you feel that staying home would be more relaxing. Yeah. Now I'm able to look at my past self and I was doing so much. I was doing so much and I was okay while I was doing it. I was perfectly fine. but. There was no need, you know, there was no need. So if you're the mom that you're doing too much, you might not see it, but somebody tells you, believe them. You are doing too much. And uh, if you need help, don't be shy about accepting it because I'm the one, I've been the one who, if I ask somebody for a favor or for help, it's because I really, really need that favor. Because I'm the type that if I can do it all, I'm going to do it all. But I, I've learned. <laughs> so now I'm, mm-hmm. taking, uh, I'm taking it more easy. Oh, yeah, that's good to hear. That, that would be my, my advice. Sorry, Maggie, just a follow-up question. If you don't have a stomach, how do you eat? <laughs> Well, they connect the esophagus to the small intestine. So that becomes like a, like a tube, which in time would expand. But at first, let's say it's like, if I drink water, I have to drink it, take my time. I cannot drink the water like how I mm. do because I would faint or something would happen to me because it's, this is like a, a straw now. Okay. Yes. So now I have to be, uh, I have to relearn how to eat. 
I see. It's been challenging, but uh, I feel like in life, you get used to everything. Mm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And cancer is gone. So cancer is that's gone. great news. Yeah. Yes. And I'm able to do everything that I was doing before. Mm-hmm. Drink my water really fast. How about you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's probably not good for anyone anyway. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. I should talk to Alvin. He does that all the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like my daughter would say to me, Mommy, don't worry. I'm when I become famous. I'm going to get somebody to write a book about your life because I feel <laughs> like I've, I've been through so much in life and, you know, with the kids, with my own life. When I came to this country, I didn't go to school back in Dominican Republic. So it's like I skipped. I didn't go to third grade, four, five, six, and they jumped me to eighth grade in, in here. So not knowing English, not knowing Spanish. I managed to go to high school. I I got my high school diploma. I went to college for a year and a half, but then I have my daughter. My daughter is not my husband's biologically child. Her father passed away, Samantha's father, when she was a a year. I was not together with him, but it was still a traumatic event. Mm. So in... You know, I feel like I've been jumping hoops all of mm. my life. <laughs> and then, you know, trying to move around, trying to find a good school system for the boys. I Like we've never really like have taken time to go on vacation because it's always something. So when we finally found the time to go on vacation and go to Florida, that's when I got the diagnosis of cancer. And it's like, can we get a break? <laughs> mm. But um, now... You know, I feel that I was able to recover from my illness. The kids are doing great. My husband and I now, to be honest, like we have the best relationship now that we ever had. And it's funny. It's it's crazy because it's we've been together for 20 years. We met at the gym and we still go to the gym together. And we <laughs> not all the time, but. Yeah. Always working, but we have the best workout. So you see, like when the kids are okay, we're okay. Mm. But if there's so much unbalance on, you know, on needing the services and, and you know, but it's under control and it's been like that for a while and I'm embracing everything and I'm, I feel so grateful, mm. beyond grateful for yeah. uh, everything. Yeah. All right, Maggie. Well, how can people learn more about you? Do you have social media you'd like to share? I do have um, Instagram. It's uh, M-A-G-G underscore underscore 23. And uh, my email is uh, Samadari, S-A-M-A-D-A. RY30 at yahoo.com. Great. All right. Well, I'll put that in our show notes if people want to get in touch with you. Oh, thank you, Rachel. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for being open with us and sharing your story. Oh. You're welcome. Thanks for tuning in to Autism Knows No Borders. We've all heard the saying, you can't fill from an empty cup. Oftentimes, parents and caregivers have so much on their plate that they tend to put everyone else's needs before their own. Burnout and stress can lead to serious physical and mental health problems, let alone compromised care for loved ones. As Maggie suggested, one way to avoid getting overwhelmed is to set boundaries and know when to ask for help. If you're a parent, how do you practice self-care? You can connect with other parents going through experiences similar to yours, as well as find support and self-care resources in our global autism community. Just a reminder, our community is open to anyone related to autism. Whether you're a self-advocate, a family member, or a professional in the field, you can participate in these important conversations on our platform. Sign up today at community.globalautismproject.org.
Let's work together to transform how the world relates to autism. Thanks for listening. Take care. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. You've been listening to Autism Knows No Borders, brought to you by the Global Autism Project. You can find Rachel's notes for this episode and learn more about today's guests at autismknowsnoborders.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. By doing so, you'll be helping us increase awareness and acceptance of autism around the world. You've been watching Autism Knows No Borders. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Also, we'd love to hear from you, so let us know what you think in the comment section. Click here to watch another interview from our podcast. You can also find us on your favorite podcast app. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. Thanks for watching. Take care.